Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church. My name is Samuel Jeske. I serve as the pastor at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church, a congregation located in Crown Point, Indiana, a small congregation with a big vision and an even bigger Savior. And I'm so glad that that you and I, we could we could gather together and worship today. Whether you are a member of Our Shepherd or a, a guest or a visitor, uh, we're just so glad that you're here worshiping with us. It wouldn't be the same without you. I hope and pray that you had a blessed Thanksgiving. Um, no doubt your Thanksgiving celebrations looked a whole lot different this year. And nevertheless, uh, whether you were meeting up with family in person or celebrating virtually, um, I'm glad that uh, you got a chance to celebrate. And I hope and pray that you found reason to rejoice uh, as there are overwhelmingly reasons to rejoice in our Savior Jesus, your God who loved you so much he would veil himself in humanity, that he would He would walk a perfect life in your shoes, he would die on the cross for your sins and, and carry your, sh- your, your shame, your guilt, and all of your regrets onto himself and in exchange give you his righteousness and the right to be called a child of God and, and win for you a home with him in heaven. Uh, I hope and pray that you found reason to rejoice in that this Thanksgiving season. I myself, one of the things that I'm quite thankful for is I got a chance to celebrate Thanksgiving with my family, which is where I'm at. I'm I'm not recording from from my house, my study in Crown Point. I'm actually recording from my dad's study in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Nevertheless, even now that we're separated by by distance, uh, we nevertheless, um, as believers who are who are gathering together in our triune God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the God who made you, the God who saved you, the God who set you apart. When we gather in his name, he assures us that he is in what He is with us, um, that he is powerfully and presently at work, that he is, that he is engaged and, and, and powerfully at work in his word, um, strengthening and, and creating faith in the hearts of people, assuring us that his promises are, are steadfast and true and ever comforting and ever certain. Our God is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us as we wait for him. That's kind of what the season of Advent is, isn't it? It's kind of a season of waiting, waiting for our God to come. Uh, That word Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which means coming. And certainly, um, as we celebrate Advent, we think of Christ's first coming, um, as he was born and, and, and laid in a manger, uh, born in humility and, and uh, uh, to be a servant, to lay down his life to save, to die on a cross to redeem the world from sin, death, and the power of hell. But we who are celebrating this season of Advent, we don't just have our eyes on Christ's first coming, we have our eyes on Christ's coming again. Whether that be in glory to judge the living and the dead or when Christ comes to take us home to be with him, we want to be ready. And so while we wait, um, we also want to be ready. And that's going to be our theme today, being ready as we wait for Jesus. Uh, May God richly bless our time in word and song today.
Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. 
Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The section of scripture that we'll be looking at today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 6. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal and every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. Stephen Fry is an accomplished English actor. He's a comedian and a prolific author. I was first introduced to Stephen Fry through the British TV show Jeeves and Wooster, where actor Hugh Laurie plays Bertie Wooster, an unrefined, lazy, absolute mess of a bachelor. And Stephen, Pro Stephen Fry, he plays Reginald Jeeves, who's this refined, intelligent, sophisticated, well-mannered valet or butler who's constantly employing his brilliance to get Bertie Wooster out of trouble. Where Wooster is dull, Jeeves is perceptive. Where Wooster is tardy, Jeeves is always on time. Where Wooster is vulgar, Jeeves is always pleasant. But if you get Stephen Fry talking about religion, all pleasantries are out of the window. Stephen Fry is an outspoken, passionate atheist. An interviewer once asked Fry what he would say to God should he stand before him in heaven. And Fry, without missing a beat, said his first words to God would be, How dare you? 
Fry argues that should any God exist in this world, there's absolutely no way a God could possibly be considered loving. Given the abundance of suffering and evil in this world, Fry contests that it's more likely that any alleged God would be more accurately characterized, to paraphrase Fry, as a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who bears ultimate responsibility for a world full of injustice and pain. And then you get to Genesis chapter 6. A world full of injustice and pain. Also a chapter cataloging a divinely sent worldwide flood intended to wipe humanity from the face of the earth. And it seems like the God of the Bible is playing right into Stephen Fry's hand. Could a loving God actually do something like that? Is God still all loving on the other end of Genesis chapter 6? The account of Noah prompts a lot of questions. Questions like, how did Noah get all the animals onto the ark? Or was the flood in Genesis 6 actually a worldwide flood? And the Bible gives us answers to those questions. The biblical text indicates that God, who created all those animals in the first place, God was the one who brought all those animals to Noah. Not only do the New Testament authors attest to the historicity of a worldwide flood, there's also geological evidence that that corroborates a worldwide flood too. Not only did it rain torrentially for over an entire month, but water burst forth from the springs within the earth, resulting in a massive deluge that swept over the entire earth and covered even the highest of the highest mountains, just as God said it would. And that shouldn't surprise us. I mean, after all, why would orchestrating a worldwide flood be outside of God's power if he, the creator of the heavens and earth, made the heavens and earth from nothing? But the one question that Christians are sometimes afraid to ask about Genesis chapter 6 is the question Stephen Fry most certainly would ask if given the chance. How could a loving God actually do something like that? Just last week, I had a conversation with a Christian who was grappling with this very topic, particularly about how could a God of love send a worldwide flood, let alone threaten eternal punishment in hell. For him, this was extremely difficult to understand, let alone even ask And maybe you can relate. Maybe you'd rather focus on the cute side of the account of Noah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Those cute kitty Noah's Ark Fisher Price play sets full of those cute little animals. And you take it into the bathtub with you and and, and they're absolutely adorable, right? I think I had one of those when I was a kid. But part of why those play sets are cute is because they've been completely sanitized of why there was a flood in the first place. Others have tried to gloss over or get rid of passages where God speaks and and acts this way. As someone once said to me, Jesus preached love, not hell. And ironically enough, not only does Jesus preach the reality of hell, but he uses words for hell more than any other person in the Bible. God takes sin seriously. You hear it in the words of Jesus, but you also see it in Genesis chapter 6, so seriously that he would send a worldwide flood as judgment. A God of absolute love and absolute justice it may seem paradoxical in our minds, but even from a human perspective, love and justice, they're not adversaries. Martin Luther King Jr. paraphrased it nicely 
uh, or to paraphrase him, uh, what he said, rather, is that power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. A power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands or is love correcting everything that stands against love. When our earthly justice systems fail to exact absolute justice, well, we call it unloving. If a murderer were released on a technicality or if, if corrupt criminals would buy or bribe their way out of their crimes, we're rightfully indignant and call such failures of a judicial system unjust and unloving. And if that's how it is in our courtrooms, how much more in God's? If you cheapen God's justice, you cheapen his love. And if you cheapen his love, you cheapen his justice. A God who, who loves all that is good naturally hates all that is evil. There is no logical incompatibility between God's love and his justice. Is our uneasiness about a worldwide flood because we feel such a response on God's behalf was unwarranted? Genesis 6 verse 5 says that the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Children of God were little by little falling away from faith in God. They didn't just run after pagan spouses, but ran after pagan lifestyles. And they thought they were doing absolutely nothing wrong. That what they were doing was in fact good. The sons of God, believers, saw the daughters of men, unbelievers. Their beliefs and lifestyles, literally, in the Hebrew, they saw all these things as good. And that they saw these unbelievers, and they saw all these things that these unbelievers were doing, and their lifestyles, and the violence, and the evil, and the selfishness, and the corruption, that they saw all these things as good. It harkens back to Genesis chapter 3 when mankind saw something else and thought it was good. When Eve in the Garden of Eden saw that fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that taking that fruit of the tree was good. The thing is, is it wasn't good. And with that rebellion against God, sin and death entered this world. And generations to come wouldn't be born in the image of God, but in the sinful image of their sinful parents. By Genesis chapter 4, you see a brother murdering his brother out of je- jealousy. By Genesis chapter 5, you, you hear of another man bragging about how he murdered someone. But by the time we arrive at Genesis chapter 6, the, the, the evil, the violence, the corruption, the sinfulness had gotten so perverse, so wicked, and so vile that God's heart was filled with pain. Eventually, their their time of grace had run out. The first of those 40 days started like any other normal day. They got up in the morning and got ready for their day. But that was no normal, ordinary day. It began to rain, and it kept on raining. By then, it was too late. A God who is absolutely just, he doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. And now we're at the beating heart of the uneasiness that we might feel when we read Genesis chapter 6. Because it's, it's not the question, could a loving God wash a sinful world away with righteous judgment that makes us uneasy? No, the question is, will a loving God do that to me? We have every right and reason, like Stephen Fry, to be incensed by our world's senseless acts of malice, selfishness, violence, and cruelty. A world full of suffering and evil was never part of God's design. All of mankind certainly falls victims, uh, so falls victim to evils within this world, but 
but the human conscience bears witness that we are not just the victims. We are also the perpetrators. In the international wake of the horrors of Auschwitz, for example, there was both international outrage and contrite remorse because such unthinkable evil unfolded in the hearts of everyday common people. That is our experience in the face of evil. As Christian apologist Glenn Scrivener once wrote, we feel evil's power, but we also know ourselves somehow to be complicit in it. Our sinful nature would convince us the evil of Auschwitz or the evils of Genesis chapter 6, that the corruption and the violence, that it's something far, far beyond any of us when those evils already exist inside of our hearts. Why then did the flood not wash away Noah and his family? If they were just as sinful as everyone else, why are, them, why are they hemmed in to God's ark by the Lord and not anyone else? Because Noah and his family were in God's favor. And that favor wasn't extended to them because of who they were or because of the good works that they had done. Sure, Noah lived an upright moral life, but his rightness with God had nothing to do with his works. God graciously delivered Noah and his family because they in faith clung to the Lord for dear life. The God of covenant promise the God who had made a promise to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the God who reiterated that covenant promise to Noah and his family, who established that promise to Noah and his family, that a Savior would come and redeem and rescue this fallen, broken world from sin and death, that Noah and his family, they trusted that promise. And because they believed in God and that gracious promise, they through faith were credited with righteousness being right with God. They entered the ark and were delivered, not from the floodwaters, but by the floodwaters, delivered from the paganism, the violence, the godlessness, and the evil that not only threatened their physical lives, but their saving trust in the one true God, the Lord, the God of grace and compassion, the God who saves the same waters that brought judgment upon wickedness, those same waters delivered Noah and his family. God prefaces this chapter of cataclysmic judgment in Genesis chapter 6 with his love as he for 120 years graciously and patiently endured the callous rejection of mankind whose every inclination was only evil all the time. That Genesis records that God's heart was filled with pain reminds the reader two things. Firstly, that God is just, that God's wrath is, is not indiscriminate, that his wrath is neither arbitrary nor temperamental. But secondly, these words remind us that God's grace is indiscriminate. That God's love indiscriminately falls on our fallen world as he truly desires that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, even the people at the time of Noah. And God didn't, he didn't sit passively those 120 years. Uh, no, God, he was actively patient, pursuing those people in love. He called Noah to evangelize and to proclaim the gospel, the good news of God's deliverance and his grace and his mercy to those people during those 120 years. Because God takes no delight in the death of the wicked, but rather he delights that they turn to him and live. And that same God is at work today in our time and in our place, preaching and proclaiming his word through his church to this world, readying hearts to receive him when he comes again. Noah and his family, they didn't know the day nor the hour the promised Savior would come, but they knew that Savior was coming. And that Savior has come, 
Uh, that Savior has rescued this world from sin, death, and hell. Uh, that Savior will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And, and that Savior goes out into the world through his word to call all during their time of grace to himself, uh, that they turn to him in faith and live. Our triune God, the Lord, our God, he defines himself as a God of, of compassion and graciousness, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. An entire world wiped clean and eviscerated by floodwaters, it seems extremely difficult to anchor in a divine, eternal, co- compassionate, loving personality. Yet even from a human perspective, anger and love are intimately connected. I mean, think about it. A woman who loves her husband rightfully burns with anger when he has an affair. How much more for the Lord, whose jealousy is an all-consuming fire which burns for our hearts to be wholly his. God's judgments always stand in the service of his grace, one theologian said. The flood of righteous judgment that followed God closing the ark behind Noah and his family. That wasn't the divine artist dispassionately throwing away the canvas. Those floodwaters that that came after God closed that ark. No, God wasn't abandoning his creation. He wasn't washing it clean in the sense that he was throwing it away. No, no. He was preserving his promise to save it and also lovingly preserving the children who who were clinging to that promise. That water symbolizes your baptism through which God saved you when he washed you and made you his child and intimately connected you to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to his perfect life, his death on the cross where he died with all of your sins and and his resurrection from the dead. Your God in grace has called you and set you apart to be his child. Is God still an all-loving God on the other end of Genesis chapter 6? Let me ask you this. Is God still an all-loving God when he punished his one and only son on the cross for you? True justice exists because God loves what is good. That eternal love of God is not just expressed by delivering people eternally from evil, but conversely expressed through eternal judgment and punishment of evil. Because love hates what is evil. Need proof? Look at the cross. On the cross, God's love burns for sinners and against sinners. The love of God is shown inversely, not only by hating what is evil, but exacting justice upon it. The punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him, on Jesus. Likewise, the love of God is shown by not only punishing someone else in our place, but being that someone else. By Christ's wounds, we are healed. We are at peace with God in Jesus. Your Savior Jesus, he endured the hell we deserved so that we wouldn't have to, so that we would have a home safe at God's side in heaven. This Advent season, let's fix our eyes on Jesus our Savior, our Rock, and our Redeemer. In Christ, we are ready. Amen.
Let's go to our God in prayer. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. All this we pray confidently in his saving holy name and pray also the prayer that he has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Good morning again. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. I hope and pray that you are edified and uplifted by our worship service today. If you found this encouraging and uplifting, my, I have two uh, requests for you. Uh, share this with someone who really would need this uplifting encouragement. Um, certainly uh, there are many things in, in our lives that, that seek to, to rob and rob us of joy, but then also um, cause us to fixate our attention on these things, especially now trying to navigate the holiday season in the midst of a, the uncertainties of this pandemic. Um, nevertheless, uh, the words of, of our Savior Jesus uh, to, to come to him, um, all who are weary and heavy burdened, that he will give us rest. Um, those are real words of absolute eternal hope and comfort. And uh, my encouragement is that you share not only um, this video, but words of comfort with people um, that would be benefited and blessed by it. But also, I would encourage you uh, to support the ministry of Our Shepherd, um, either by uh, contributions online. You can find the link um, to give um, electronically, um, at our secure portal. Um, you can find that uh, either the link in the description of this video or you can also give by mailing checks to um, Our Shepherd's address. Um, uh, both are great ways to support the ministry of Our Shepherd. We can't continue the ministry uh, getting more uh, Christ-centered, gospel-driven content out to people uh, without your prayers and your support. Uh, continue to pray for the, the ministry of Our Shepherd too. Um, pray that uh, that God not only give us wisdom, but also guidance as we navigate these very uncertain times, um, but that he continue to, um, to direct us um, and uh, give us uh, minds of wisdom and hearts of compassion as we continue to pursue the lost um, with the never-changing, uh, never ever-comforting message of Jesus. A couple other announcements. We got our Pathway to Membership class, Faith, uh, faith Builders. Uh, we'd love it if you'd attend. If you got any questions about Christianity, if you're checking out Our Shepherd and you want to know what are the next steps or how can I learn a little bit more, um, or if you're looking for a refresher course to build up your faith, Faith Builders is a great way to, to, to take those next steps. Um, you can sign up for that class or find out how to RSVP with the link in the description of this video, either uh, whether you're watching it on Facebook or on YouTube or on our website. Um, you can find out more about Faith Builders there. Um, also, um, this upcoming Wednesday and the Wednesdays to come during uh, the season of Advent, we have our midweek Advent services. And uh, those will um, be offered online and potentially in person pending COVID situations. Um, our congregation is continually reevaluating the situation to um, assess um, when it is um, responsible for us to resume in person services. Uh, nevertheless, you can always tune in watch those services online. This, this year's uh, Advent theme for Our Shepherd, uh, we're going to be focusing on um, a world in waiting. Um, as uh, I already mentioned earlier, during the season of Advent, we're certainly waiting. Um, but in many ways, we're waiting right now in the middle of a pandemic. We're waiting for this pandemic to go away. Go away. We might be waiting for um, that diagnosis to come back. Or we might be waiting for the... Um, we might be waiting for that job uh, that we've been wanting for a really, really long time as we've been unemployed, navigating these uh, these uncertain times. Uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of waiting. Well, wow, there's much waiting in our lives. Uh, we're reminded that our God's promises remain ever true and that uh, those who wait on the Lord do not wait in vain. And that's what we're going to be reminded of in this, uh, this midweek Advent series. Um, and I hope and pray that you can join us um, uh, that's all that I got for today. Uh, may God richly bless your week, and we'll see you again next week for worship.